Welcome to our fourth and final session, whether you're here in person or watching online. And I know quite a few of you have been, so uh, let's uh, begin with our opening invocation. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my cry. Let your ears be attentive. To my cry for mercy. We have come as the people of God. To voice our pain and assert our hope. We have come as the people of God. Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Well, <coughs> last week when we looked at chapter 4, we uh, explored the world of theodicy. And this week we're going to look at something equally um, challenging, I think. And that is uh, the question of the sovereignty of God as we uh, explore chapter 5 of Lamentations. Thus far, all of the chapters that we've looked at have followed that pattern where they're ordered by the Hebrew alphabet. Yes, we've learned that, haven't we? Uh, this week, things change in chapter 5. It makes me wonder, actually, if this is a, a poem that's been added on by someone else. But whatever, it's unique. Uh, while it continues to highlight the themes regarding the devastation of Jerusalem, it doesn't follow that poetic pattern of the other chapters. The verses rather are much shorter, almost uh, staccato-like uh, in their wording, a rapid fire summary of grief, if you will. And, and throughout it is written in the first person plural, making it a corporate statement of lament, probably intended to be on the site of the ruined temple. Mm. You know, it's about 586, isn't it? And uh, at the end of this, we're not going to know how things work out uh, for uh, Jerusalem. There's a remarkable passage in, in Jeremiah, I think, uh, in the middle of all this stuff going on, God tells him that one of his cousins is going to go and come and see him and ask him to buy a field. Who, who is going to buy a field at this time? You know, the, it's under... Mm -hmm. it's, it's been ripped up, it's mm -hmm. torn up. Every, you know, why would you? Uh, but this cousin thinks he's, he's going to get some money out of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah buy, buys the field. In the, mid, in the midst of this terror, he buys the field. Uh, and it's a statement of hope. Uh, he's doing so. It's remarkable. Uh, because he's not even going to see the benefit of it. Because Jeremiah knows full well that actually uh, things will turn around for the people of Israel. That is his prophetic insight but that it's going to be a way off, a generation off. So he's not going to personally benefit from this field. Nevertheless, uh, in front of witnesses, he uh, completes this transaction, as you would do, and seals up the deed and uh, puts it in a sealed jar uh, so that uh, his deed for this field will pass on. To his relatives who, who follow. A statement of, of hope, if you will. So, chapter 5 begins. Remember, uh, and we've talked about that word a lot already, haven't we? Um, it, that plea to God to remember his, remember his promises. Remember, O oh Lord, what has befallen us. Look and see our disgrace, our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our homes to aliens. This is the land on which Jeremiah has bought his field. We have become orphans, fatherless, our mothers are like widows. We must pay for the water we drink. The wood we get must be bought. With a yoke on our necks we are hard driven. We are weary, we are given no rest. It's 
the picture that we've seen already. But then we get to verse 5. We have made a pact with Egypt and Assyria to get enough bread. This has always been the issue, hasn't it? Looking to Egypt. Our ancestors sinned. And here we have a really interesting confession for previous generations. Our ancestors have sinned and they are no more. And we bear their iniquities. Now, I do not buy the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> <It's brass product. laughs> I know somebody does, but you I don't know. The, <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> uh, the, the Telegraph is getting a right old head of steam up about the Church of England mm. at, at the moment. And um, that's about um, changes because of declining parishes, but also it's got a head of steam up about um, the fact that the Church of England are considering making a huge reparation uh, for previous injustices, particularly concerning the slave trade. Mm. And they're working out how to, to do that. And uh, I think Justin Welby has been extraordinarily brave in that. But so many people are asking, you know, this is all a bit woke. That's what they're saying. And, you know, we should give up on uh, confessing and making good for the deeds of our ancestors. Here, mm -hmm. this is where this chapter begins. And it would seem to me that it suggests, what do you think? I guess is one of the, the questions. I think it's a difficult one, isn't it? In that I think there's there's plenty of wrong happening right now to start going back. I mean, I'm not saying that we shouldn't go back, but we don't want to lose sight of the stuff that's happening now as well. I don't know. It's mm. difficult. It's tricky, but I suppose thinking about that example with the slave trade. Mm. It's still not on, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. And yeah. so it's still... Mm. Still relevant. You know, we, yeah. and, and it's just sometimes so distressing, you'd think we've got beyond certain mm. behaviours or attitudes. Mm. We haven't. Mm. A, lot, a lot of them. And I, and I think that's because it's still implicit in a lot of our, you know, social fabric and attitudes yeah. and so on. But I can understand why, why he's doing that. I'm aware of the controversy, the, the only bits I see in the Telegraph are bits that come up on, mm -hmm. online and you have to pay to get me on the fifth line. Yeah. 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 You do, you don't do. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I kind of hit off bits of, of what you're talking about. Well, that's um, exactly how I act. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, but every day. There's... But there's Vicky's points valid as well, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Because there's so much now mm -hmm. to get engaged with. And, mm -hmm. so, it is, it is tricky. I think the trouble is, it's like everything, it's become politicised, doesn't it? Mm. Because, the, you know, the, the, the woke sayers, um, who are, you know, their, their motives in, in criticising him, I wouldn't want to be associated with, really. Mm. Um, but I, I think it's brave of them as well. I, I, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe in in going back to that, you're also still addressing things that are an issue now, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Thinking about your point, Vicky. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. Because actually those communities are still disadvantaged. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. They are yeah. disadvantaged. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like the stem of it, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So if you sort that yeah. out, then the rest potentially. Mm -hmm. I think it's a tricky one. It is tricky. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I assume that the money isn't going to go to certain people that are descended uh, in, in the slave trade situation. Surely it's going to the people that are um, disadvantaged, that have come from that. I don't know how they're going to do it. I think, 
what, what I know is um, in Liverpool Diocese is going on is that we're very involved in this thing called the, the Triangle of, yeah. of Hope. Uh, and that is uh, trying to address uh, some of the yields that have gone on. Uh, and one of the things that happened when Bishop John was made bishop was that he did sit in the throne momentarily because he had to, that was the legal thing that was required, but he very quickly vacated it to a space in the chancel. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, bishop's throne now has got a very clear sign that actually the money that paid for it was yeah. Trade. Mm -hmm. And the cathedral are really trying to acknowledge that mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, all around. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's go on. I uh, mm -hmm. thought that was an interesting question to yeah. think about. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, as we think about generations gone, how far do we go back? But as we read on in verse Eight, we see what's going on. Slaves rule over us. There is no one to deliver us from their hand. This is worse than Egypt. They were slaves there, but now the slaves rule over them. We get bread at the peril of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin is black as an oven from the scorching heat of the famine. And then it Pulls no punches. Women are raped. And unfortunately, that is what's going on mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. in places of war yeah. mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. And that should move us to, to lament even today. The virgins in the towns of Judah. And then I wonder what's going on in verse. Well, princes are hung up by their hands. No respect is shown to the elders. And I wonder about that princes being hung up by their hands, whether actually what's going on is a physical lynching, almost, in the, in the mm. streets. Young men are compelled to grind, and boys stagger under loads of wood. The old men have left the city gate. The young men, their music, the joy of our hearts has ceased, and our dancing has been turned to mourning. And of course, the prophets will promise to turn our mourning to dancing, but this is the reversal of that. But then there's a shift in verse 16. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. What's the shift? It's this, that they've moved from acknowledging the sin of previous generations to acknowledging actually their own complicity, mm. their own sin. Confession for previous generations transitions to confession for their own sin. And in one sense, that is far more profound. So Vicky, you were onto something mm -hmm. when you said, what about you know, our own need for confession mm -hmm. in this moment? And because of this, our hearts are sick. Because of these things, our eyes have grown dim. Because of Mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals prowl over it. And then another trans transition is the confession of faith. But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. It's a confession of faith, but it's different from that which we saw in chapter 3. Do you remember? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They 
they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. There, the articulation of faith is to do with God's faithfulness and his love. Here, the author is focusing on something different, and that is the sovereignty of God, God's sovereign, sovereign will. You, O oh God, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. So it's moved on from Yahweh's love and compassion and faithfulness to Yahweh's sovereignty. So I want to think about the will of God. Is it uh, God's sovereign will that this has happened to Jerusalem? See, I told you we're going to get into something a bit even harder than for you to see tonight. <laughs> Throne enduring for all generations, wiping the forgottenness completely. I wonder whether it's the other way around, or whether the, yes, his throne is enduring, but maybe the people have forgotten him. Or... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what we what we I don't know. What I think you might be reaching for is the difference between um, God's moral will for His creation and particularly for us as people, that we should love and serve him and follow him um, unconditionally. That is his will for, for all humankind. Mm. Yeah? Mm. His, his will is that we should care for one another and care for his, his creation. Mm. Now, uh, that's his will for us, but we are rebellious against that against that world, in our, in our brokenness, in our sinfulness. God's sovereign will is something different. It will happen. In his sovereignty, if he's willed it to happen, it will happen. Now that's, that gets us to a bit of a dilemma. Mm -hmm. um, because of our sinfulness. What about free will as well? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. What about free free will? Mm -hmm. And actually, what about the nature of God? Mm -hmm. Is God Himself sinful in allowing sin? <laughs> and the, the the dichotomy between God's moral will and His sovereign will is the answer to. what 
John the Baptist will call the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And uh, as we explored a couple of weeks ago, the whole of the Trinity is involved in that moment. It's not that the Father turns his face away, but rather he is feeling the absolute pain and agony of that moment, as to the Spirit, who, who will be sent by the Father and the Son. Does that make sense? So we've paused a moment. You've alluded already, Vicky, to the last three verses. Why have you forgotten us completely? Why have you forsaken us these many days? Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. There's the ask, yeah? Mm -hmm. The complaint and the ask. Renew our days of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond all measure. And there the book finishes. And we will have to look to other places in the Old Testament to see how the story resolves itself. It's a bit ambiguous, isn't it? So the book ends with questions rather than answers. Uh, the community are yet to discover the bond of faith of their leader, it seems. And I mean, time will tell how things will turn out. Mm. We've thought about Romans 8 quite a lot as we've thought about lamentation. And uh, I wanted to pick up on uh, Romans 8, verses 18 through to 21. Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but here's this idea about the sovereignty of God coming again, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Was that us in our rebellion? Was it Satan? Well, I don't think either of those answers are, are good enough because actually by the, one, the will of the one who subjected it in hope must surely be God himself. Mm that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And that is the ultimate sovereign will of God. So, Brian Zahn says, the only credible Christian theodicy is that Christ, that in Christ God fully participates in human suffering and that suffering is not the end of the story. So a poem. It's by uh, Jan Richardson again from Circle of Grace. Rough translation. Hope nonetheless. Hope despite. Hope regardless. 
hope still, hope where we had ceased to hope, hope amid what threatens hope, hope with those who feed our hope, hope beyond what we had hope, hope that draws us past our limits, hope that defies expectations, hope that questions what we have known, hope that makes a way where there is none, hope that takes us past our fear, hope that calls us into life, hope that holds us beyond death, hope that blesses those to come. It was in such hope that Jeremiah built that field because he could see beyond to a day when Israel would return and be restored. And I believe to a day even beyond that when God will wipe away every tear from our eye. Consisting of pure love, God is indeed impossible and beyond all suffering until he loves that which suffers because of sin and death. Then the God who is love must suffer more deeply than any of his creation. Once we understand the love of God in this light, we can look at the suffering of Christ upon the cross and truly call it a love supreme. And as we look at the cross, we must not imagine that the suffering of the crucifixion is restricted to the incarnate Son. That's Brian's ad. From the chapter entitled A Love Supreme, after the album by John Coltrane. Coltrane is an interesting fellow. He's um, never really certain whether he expresses a, a faith in the Christian God. Uh, and yet, um, he writes in the linear notes for the album, all praise be to God, to whom all praise is due. Let us pursue him in the righteous path, yet it is true. Seek and ye shall find. Only through him can we know the most wondrous bequeathal. During the year 1957, I experienced by the grace of God the spiritual awakening which was to lead me to a richer, fuller, more productive life. At that time, in gratitude, I humbly asked to be given the means and privilege to make others happy through music. I feel I've been granted this through his grace. All praise to God. No matter what, it is with God. He is gracious and merciful. His way is in love, through which we all are. It is true, a love supreme. Mm. There is a pulse to a love supreme, which is dun 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 dun, and then there is a cacophony of noise as the piece starts. But then comes uh, that pulse through the cacophony, and a voice which repeats, "A love supreme, a love supreme, a love supreme." Any questions? Thoughts, observations? Father, as we've worked our way through this chapter, we've lamented over our own past. profiteering from slavery 
and the consequences of that. Lord, will you help us as a nation and as a church to face up to that properly? To lament over our complicitness with it now. And yet too, as we've read these words, we've seen the news today of another war zone where rape is happening almost moment by moment. We cry out to you, Lord. For your restoration. And Lord, as we've just for a moment thought about Good Friday. And your son Jesus bearing the weight, the horror of the sin of the world, which continues. And stretches from that first murder of Cain and his brother. to the horror of the wars we see. Lord, we pray that our trust would be in your Son, the one who is with you, our love supreme. And so we turn to the words on our sheets. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his, his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord. Nor the watchman wait for the morning. Neither death nor life can separate us from the love of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, strengthen you to walk with him in his risen life. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you all, now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Well, again, thank you for being with me, and thank you if you've been online too. That's sure.